we are going to discuss Negya Sutta. I hope you have your own copies. Uh, if not, listen very, very carefully, attentively, so that you may remember the contents. This discourse you find in Anguttara Nikaya. Anguttara Nikaya has nine, eleven sections. They are called Nipata. They are called, translation is numerical discourses. They are called numerical because they have numbers. One section with number one, second number two, number three, like that. This we find in the section number nine. Section number nine has nine subdivisions, each having ten discourses. So there are ninety discourses in nine section, ninth section. In this division, in the first ten of the ninth division, this is sutta number three. As I said, there are ten in each section. This is sutta number three. The Megha Sutta. You can see the translation that one day Venerable Megha uh, approached the Blessed One, Pesh Vamey to him sat at one side and said, Vante, I would like to enter Jantugama for arms. It is a very simple, innocent request. Buddha said, you may do so, Mahaji, at your own convenience. So he gave his permission for the rebel Mege to go to Jantugama for Pindapata. And then in the morning when Mege dressed, took his arms, bolts and robe, and then the Jantugama for arms. When he had walked he went to the bank after collecting food uh, out the mail, uh, returning from Armstrong, he went to the bank of Jantugama. What do you call River. Kimikala River. As he was walking and uh, wandering around for exercise along the bank of Kimikala River, the Venerable Mahaya uh, saw a very lovely, delightful mango grove. So don't think that uh, uh, monks, even the Buddhas don't, appreciate beauty. So he saw this beautiful mango grow, mango, uh, what do you call, grow, yes. It occurred to him, this mango grove is truly lovely and delightful, suitable for the striving of clansmen 
intent on striving. One who wants to strive to attain liberation, this is a very good place. If the Blessed One permits me, I will come back this mango grove to, to strive. Okay. He has a desire to go to this quiet, beautiful mango grove and sit and meditate, if Buddha permit me. Then Venerable approached the present one and prayed to write to him, sat down on side side, and then he said, this morning Bhante, I dressed, took my own aunt bowl and robe, and entered the Jantugama for arms, and then he repeated what he saw. I thought this mango grove is, is uh, truly lovely and beautiful, suitable for the striving of a classman, intent on striving. If the Blessed One permits me, I will go back to that mango grove to strive. So if the Blessed One would permit me, I will go back to that mango grove. Then, Buddha said, as we are alone now, my dear, wait until another bhikkhu comes along. Now, Buddha had assistants, supporters, helpers. Before Venerable Magya, there were several other monks, like uh, Nagasamala, Nagita, Upavana, Sunakata, Chunda, and all these were helping the Buddha, his, as, his assistant. All of them left. One day, one of, the, one of the assistants was walking with the Buddha and he said, Bhante, you go this way, I go this way. This is your rope and bowl, you take it out if I go. Like the summer, so stubborn and not so dutiful. But the Nagita stayed for a while and then uh, he wanted to take Buddha's permission for good things to go and practice meditation. And uh, Buddha said, Nagita, wait until another bhikkhu comes because I am alone. A second time, when the Nagita said to the Buddha, Blessed One, Bhante, for the Blessed One, there was nothing further to be done and no need to increase what has been done. He said, Buddha has done what had to be done. What the Buddha had done, that he doesn't have to do anymore. Buddha Uh, perfected in four noble truth as the truth, function of the truth, and completed the function of the truth. That is called Satcha Kitcha Katha. He very clearly stated in the first sermon called Dhamma Chakka Pavatra Sutta. He said, this is the noble truth of suffering. This is the noble truth of suffering. The <coughs> he fully comprehended it. Abhinyaya. This four noble truth of suffering, this is it. And there wasn't anything left that he has not understood of the four 
of the first truth, the truth of suffering. Suffering exists. No one can deny it. If somebody denies that suffering does not exist, he is utter a fool to be to, to be blunt. Is it? There is no way that you can escape from the truth. So Buddha knew that this is the truth. Then he realized the one should this what should be done with this truth. This truth should be fully comprehended. Abhinyata. Abhinyata. Fully comprehended. Without leaving any dark corner in his mind regarding the first truth. Then the third stage is this truth has been realized, it has been understood. Abhinyata. This is called Satya, Kitya, Kata. Satya means the truth, Kitya means the function, Kata means accomplished. That means theory, application of theory, and applied the theory. Three stages of the first truth. Theory, application of the theory, and application is completed. You ran, ran all the tests. It's an extremely scientific method. In science you collect information, run all the tests, and come to a conclusion. That's what he did. Then, second truth. What is the second truth? Second truth is the second truth. That is, cause of suffering. Cause of suffering. There must be a cause. And as a theory, he knew that there is a cause. That is greed. Greed is the cause of suffering. There is nothing you can do about it. As long as you have greed, you are bound to have suffering. No question about it. Remember yesterday I mentioned, Buddha gave nine similes to show the danger of greed. Danger of greed. Nine similes. That is 100% true. And the Buddha knew this is the cause of suffering, the greed. And then he knew he what should be done with this with the greed. What should be done? Greed should be abandoned. Bhatab. Greed should be abandoned. And then the third is, greed is abandoned, destroyed, completely extinguished, made into zero, nothing left behind. Every scruple of greed, he completely destroyed. This is the third. That means, the truth as a theory, the truth of cause of suffering as a theory, and put into, into practice and completed the practice. Then the third truth is the truth of end of suffering. That is attaining, that is Nibbana. Cessation of suffering. When greed is completely destroyed, suffering completely comes to an end. He knew that. That is called Nibbana. 
If somebody asks you, anybody asks you what is Nibbana, the simplest definition of Nibbana is the total, complete destruction of desire. No question about it. And then what should be done about it? That should be fully realized. Should be realized, that the practice. Then the third is, has been realized. Nibbāna should, Nibbāna is there. Nibbāna should be realized. And Nibbāna has been realized. You know, there is no way that you can play around Nirvāna, Nibbāna. You can go around it. We have to realize it in our own person. Don't ask somebody to give us nirvana. Don't try to go to nirvana from here to there. We can realize it within ourselves. So Buddha did that. Then the third truth. Theory, putting into theory into practice and completed practicing. Then Fourth truth is the path leading to the liberation of suffering. To end, or to attain nirvana, there must be a path, a way, a method that sometimes is called noble eightfold path or middle path. That is a step, a, a step system. He knew this is the path. And then what the path, what should be done with the path? The path should be practiced. Bhavitabha. Bhavitabha. And then the third step is Bhavitam. Bhavitabha means to be practiced, to be developed. That's what we do practice in meditation, practice in concentration, practice in mindfulness, practice in this, 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 this. We are practicing one of the steps of the Noble Eightfold Path. We have to practice it. And then after practicing, he said, I have practiced it, completed it, and developed it. So as he knew as a theory, the path, there is a path, there is another theory. And if this theory should be put into practice, and then he realized that he has practiced it, Bhārata. So, the blessed one, nothing further to be done. Ah. In these three phases and twelve aspects of the noble, four noble truth was completed. Tiparivattam dvādasākāraṁ Yatha Bhuta Jnana Dastanam Suvishuddham Avasi, Buddha said. Tipari Vata, three phases, Dvadasakara, twelve aspects of the Four Noble Truth was completed. And therefore further, nothing further to be done. So Megya said, Bhante, you have completed everything. No need to increase what has been done. So you, you are finished, complete. But I, you know, first time he simply asked about the, can I go and spend the time there? Then Buddha said, the wait until somebody has come. He said, one day you can say that because you are completed, <laughs> finished. But I have something further to be done and in increase what has been done. If the present the second time also he begged the Buddha, when the Buddha let me go. And the second time also Buddha said, as we are alone, maybe wait 
until another Bilkul comes. Third time Venkata Maharaja said, Venkata said, Bhante for the blessed, Bhante has nothing more, nothing further to be done, and no need to increase what has been done, but Bhante, I have something further. I have not finished my work. I need some time to practice meditation. Please, let me go. He begged the Buddha third time. I want to practice. I want to develop myself. I want to attain liberation. Please let me go. Then third time Buddha said, my dear, wait until somebody else come. But Megya, since you speak of striving, Megya, what can I say to you? You may go at your own convenience. If you want to develop, Buddha knew, Buddha was so compassionate, he saw Venerable Megya's enthusiasm. His urge to practice. At the same time, Buddha knew maybe he will go there, but he cannot practice. He will come back. And he said, Okay, go. He let him go. So then the Maggi got up, paid respect to the Buddha. Uh, paid from it the Blessed One and circumambulated. That is another very respectable thing uh, done by a very polite, uh, cultured person did those days. Paid respect and circumambulated, went around the person, showing his right shoulder towards him, that means going in uh, clockwise, clockwise this way, not counterclockwise, went around the respectable person clockwise. That we do even now, when we go to the Bodhi tree, the pagoda, Buddha images and so forth. In Buddhist countries, people take flowers, hold their palms, and go three rounds of the object. Venerable object is in the center. People go like this. This habit, this is coming down from the Buddha's time. Circumambulation keeping right side towards him and went to the mango grove. He entered and sat down at the root of a, uh, of a tree to pass the day. Then, while the Venerable was dwelling uh, in that mango grove, three kinds of bad, unwholesome thoughts frequently occurred to him. Now, in the Noble Life Small Path, there is a kind of thought called right thought. What are the right thought? Nekkama Sankappa, Avyapada Sankappa, Avyansa Sankappa. That is thought of renunciation, thought of loving friendliness, and thought of compassion. These three thoughts are just the opposite of them. First thought of honors and thought of, uh, thought of uh, sensual desire, sensual thought. Second honors and thought of, thought of ill will, the opposite of metta. Third is thought of harming, the opposite of uh, compassion. Abhimsa Sankar. How that happened? 
it is stated that Venerable Meghya was a king for 500 lives in the past. 500 lives he was a king in the past. And his, it, it, he felt like that. You know, when you go to certain places, you feel something strange. You don't have to have supernatural powers. You feel something strange in that place, as if you have been there, as if you have not been there, your, the place itself seems to be hostile. But for this month, more made here when he sat there, thought of, host, thought of greed, thought of hostility, thought of uh, harming, it was in it. Why? Because he was a king for 500, 500 lives in, in the past, and now completely forgot that he was a monk. He remembered that he was a king, enjoying sensual pleasures. That is a very big part of king's life, enjoying sensual pleasures. All dancing, girls, singing, music, all this. He remembered that then sensual pleasure rose in him. As a king, when he was enjoying, then his uh, spies brought two robbers and he asked them, asked the executioners, to put one to death by beheading. Then ill will came to his mind. Then he asked the prisoners, jailers, to take the other person to the jail, put him in jail for life. Then thought of cruelty rose in him. This was assailing him, bombarding him, and obsessing him. He cannot meditate. And he thought, this truly is astonishing, amazing. I have gone forth out of faith from the household line to the homelessness. And yet I am still stopped by these three kinds of bad unnoticed thought. Thought of desire, thought of will, thought of harmony. He could not control. And then we had to go. He went to meditate. Buddha knew all this in advance. That's why he, he was not thinking of himself. Buddha was thinking of Megya. And Buddha therefore knew that Megya could not meditate. And Buddha knew exactly what was going to happen. And since Megya insisted that he wanted to go, Buddha said, finally, okay, go. go. He knew that he would be coming back. And then, when the man Megya, out all these things, he tried, tried, tried many times, cannot meditate. Then he turned to the Buddha, paid the respect, and sat down on one side. He abandoned while then he repeated what had happened. Then, uh, Buddha said to him, Megya, when liberation of mind has not matured, five things lead to, uh, lead to it maturation. So five things you need to practice. Buddha knew that he was not matured enough to practice alone. And therefore, 
In order to have maturity, you have to do these five things. What are the five things? Bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the first thing that leads to its maturation. Having a good friend is a very important part of our spiritual practice. You all know there's a very famous statement that when the Ananda made and the Buddha reprimanded him and corrected him. When the Ananda said, when the sir, said to the Buddha, when the sir, good friends, Kalyanamitta, <coughs> is one half of spiritual practice. Spiritual, one half. Buddha said, Dhananda, don't say that, don't say that. Not only one half, complete practice depends on good friend. The pra- entire practice depends on good friends, not one half. Good friend has qualities. He was his pleasant. Pleasant, fear. He is respectable. He, res- he is respectable and he respects others. You can be respectable, but looking down upon that is not the quality of a good friend. Good friend, being respectable, At the same time, respect others. Respecting others doesn't mean bowing down and folding parts and like that. Respect others' personality, opinion, behavior, whatever the person is, you must respect that person's personality. Then, good friend is advising, talk, he can talk, he doesn't hide things. And also a good friend is uh, talkable, that means he accepts the talk. If somebody gives advice, he accepts it. It's like tameable. He has a patience. He is compassionate. He is loving, friendly person. Without any res- reservation or hesitation, he gives good advice. He never leads somebody, misleads someone. Always gives good advice. He never looks away when somebody is in trouble. He is there to help the person. And he is the one who knows the Noble Eightfold Path. He shows other people how to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, including understanding and so forth, all the steps of the Noble Eightfold Path. What else do you need? So Buddha said, Even if we take a cane and beat you, asking you to leave, don't go. You stay with him. (laughs) Even if you beat and ask you to leave, don't leave. Stay with him. That's the nature. So Buddha said, and also to attain stream entry, first stream entry, Sotapanna, you have to listen to Dhamma. You practice Dhamma, follow the Dhamma, practice, learn, listen, remember, practice and have good friend. 
कल्याण में कैसे हो गया सो गुड फ्रेंड इज ऑलवेज गुड फ्रेंड इज अ स्पिरिचुअल गुड फ्रेंड नॉट ड्रिंकिंग पार्टनर नॉट गैम्बलिंग पार्टनर नॉट नाइट क्लब गोइंग पार्टनर नॉट डांसिंग पार्टनर गुड फ्रेंड इज नॉट लाइक दैट गुड फ्रेंड इज ऑलवेज thinking of how to liberate himself or herself and help others to liberate themselves anyway that is number 1 number 2 virtues a virtue has many many aspects of virtues uh, lay people's virtues for the lay people the mean virtue means seal morality observing moral principles for the lay people five precepts are the minimum they must practice these uh, they can practice it the monastic patimok patimok has 227 precepts for monks and 311 for nuns if they are monastic monks or nuns they follow patimok possess of good conduct that is they have to have uh, indriya samvara aadi paal suti sele pratyasani sritya sele and so forth restrain in their senses restrain in their um, eating habits jagriya must they restrain their sleeping habits they don't become lazy and so forth and uh resort seeking dangers in nature in minute faults that person who is expecting to be pure lead in the path of purification the person must be afraid of doing even the slightest wrong thing having undertaken the training rules he trains in in him in them when liberation of mind has not matured this is the second thing must to keep us practice now the third is again because get to here at well without trouble or difficulty talk concerned with austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart that is talk of a uh, fullness of desire there are <coughs> these things fullness of desire when you when you are uh, too demanding your mind will be obsessed with greed then contentment you have to be satisfied with what you have it doesn't mean that you are you should not work hard to earn living you must work hard for your living but you must not uh, uh, grieve for not getting more than you deserve once you work certain amount you have to be content this applies to monks as well as lay people on solitude a solitude is also very important that there are three th- type of main solitudes uh, physical solitude mental solitude solitudes from defilement kai vega chitta vega upadi vega in pali then the Uh, talk on uh, virtue, seal of kata. Talking about developing morality. When we de- talk about developing morality, we encourage each other, and then each others are on the same pedestal. They are practicing together in harmony. Then it, then things go on very well with them. And then. Uh, virtual behavior and concentration. Of course, 
Buddha said, don't associate with people who don't have concentration. Associate with people who have concentration. And on wisdom, have discussion that improve your wisdom, your understanding, especially Dhamma. On liberation, liberation from greed, hatred and delusion. On the knowledge and vision of liberation, these are highest virtues or practices. So Buddha said, when, libera- when liberation of mind has not matured, this is the third thing that leads to its maturation. Four is, again Bhikkhu has aroused energy of, uh, there are four types of energy, practice, energy to prevent, restrain our senses, that is Sangara Padana. Then energy or striving to overcome already arisen, unwholesome mental state. And energy or effort to arouse unnecessary wholesome mental state. Then energy or effort to develop, cultivate, maintain, sustain, support, wholesome mental state that is already arisen. I have no time to enlist all these uh, categories in detail, but uh, we have to remember this. Then, these are the things that one has to practice in order to mature one's own spiritual practice. Then the number five, again Bhikkhu is wise. Now this is also a very important thing to remember. What is wise? What can one, how can one be wise? What shall one do, should do done, should be done to be wise? He possesses the wisdom that dis, that uh, uh, discern rising and passing away. That is called wisdom. Wisdom means seeing, rising and falling. Udayabbe jnana. Udayabbe jnana is called wisdom. Seeing, rising and falling. That means seeing impermanence. Impermanence is described as seeing rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. Friends, everything in the whole universe is rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. Every tiny minor thing in the entire universe. Seeing this very clearly is called wisdom, which is noble and, and penetrative and lead to the complete destruction of suffering. When we see rising and falling or impermanence exactly as it is, then we can end our suffering. How? When we see rising and falling, we can end our suffering. How can we end our suffering by seeing rising and falling? How can we can see rising and falling? Chemists can see rising and falling. Physicists can see rising and falling. Are they enlightened? No. When we see rising and falling, there is one more thing we have to do. What is that? Don't try to cling to it. If you try, if you cling to something that is rising and falling, you end up in frustration because you cannot cling to something always rising and falling. <laughs> Before you even think of clinging, it is gone. It is gone. If you have this wisdom of rising and falling, 
you will not try to cling to anything you ask yourself are you wise have you seen rising and falling if you have seen rising and falling you all should have attained enlightenment because you don't try to cling to anything cling cling to wife husband children property computer job money bank account property no we don't see rising and falling and that is why we cling okay and then when liberation of mind has not matured this is the first thing that leads to maturation when make a, a bhikkhu has good friend good companion good uh, comrade it can be expected from that he will be virtuous one who dwells sustained by patima can support and uh, will train him in them when a bhikkhu has good friend good companion and so on and so forth uh, that he will get to hear at will without trouble or difficulty talk concerned with the austere life that we mentioned earlier then he will get out energy he will possess wisdom and then having based on himself on these five things the bhikkhu should develop further four things these four things also are very important what are they perception of unattractiveness should be developed what is the perception asubha sanya asubha sanya perception of unattractiveness should be developed when we develop unattractiveness we have to be we have to we have to do it very carefully what is unattractive unattractive our own bodies in this body there are 32 parts each of them is not attractive although we assume that they are attractive they are not head hair are they attractive we think they are attractive but head hair is not attractive then what should we do we hate our head hair if it is not attractive you know either attachment or detachment if it is attractive we become attached to it if it is not attractive we try to reject it can we reject our hair we cannot they are they grow we have to accept them even though they are neither attractive nor repulsive no repulsive we have to practice this unattractiveness uh, of uh, the perception of unattractiveness of uh, 32 parts of the body we have to practice it impartially there's a danger of partiality if we think it is beautiful we cling to it then we end up in suffering if we try to reject it we begin we we end up in hating when we practice this unattractiveness meditation we should not develop hatred towards us if we develop a hatred towards us hatred towards us the danger is that we can even 
kill ourselves, commit suicide. This is ugly, 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 dirty, 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 I don't want to live with this and so forth. It has happened in the Buddha's time, sixty monks killed themselves. They were monks during the Buddha's time. And Buddha asked them to practice unattractiveness of the body. And he went for two weeks retreat. When he returned, many monks had been killed. They kill each other or kill them, them boys themselves or they were homicide or suicide when the Buddha came. So many monks were killed. Then Buddha asked Vendakarananda, what happened to the monk? They said they said the body was ugly, dirty, uh, unattractive, repulsive. They killed. Then Buddha taught the Anapana for the Sutta, that is the story. So when we practice unattractiveness, we must practice it mindfully. External four elements, internal four elements are the elements. They all are impermanent. They all are unsatisfactory. They all are without self. That is how we have to practice unattractiveness of the body. That is number one. Number two, loving kindness should be developed to overcome ill will. Loving uh, unattractiveness of the body should be developed to overcome our lust, greed, and metta should be, what do you call, uh, metta should be practiced to overcome ill will. And metta also should be practiced in a very mindful way. Uh, if we misunderstand the practice of metta, we can be deluded and uh, one example I tell you, in metta, met, uh, ben, the met, benefit of metta discourse called metta and sansa, metta and sansa discourse. In that discourse Buddha has given eleven benefits of practicing metta. One of them is that when you practice metta, fire, poison, and weapon does not affect you. Nasa agiva, satthamva, visamva, kamati. That is the seventh benefit. And people think if they practice metta, fire will not burn them. Poison will not hurt them. Weapons will not hurt them. <coughs> That's what they literally, they, they, they take it literally and think that this will not affect us. Fire will not affect us, poison will not affect us, weapon will not affect us. Suppose we are practicing meditation and, uh, you know, close all the doors and windows and somebody comes and sets fire to the house, do you think we won't be burnt up, burnt? burn in the fire, surely we will be burnt. If somebody put some poison into a piece of cake and or drink and ask her to eat or drink, we drink it. Poison will be affect us. If somebody comes behind and you know with a close range shoot, bullet definitely goes through our body and we will be killed. So what does it mean that fire poison weapon doesn't affect me? It simply means this. Ill will not affect us. Ill will not arise in us when we practice metta. There is a Aditya Pariya Sutta in Madhyamanika, in, in, in our Mandana book. Aditya Pariya, that is fire sermon. In the fire sermon, Buddha said, because eyes are on fire, ears are on fire, nose, are, nose is on fire, tongue is on fire, 
body is on fire, mind is on fire, fire of what? Raga kina, dosa kina, moha kina, aditta. Chakum beke aditta, rupe aditta, chakum sampasa and so forth. All these are on fire. On what fire? Ra, there are eleven fires. Greed, hate, delusion, birth, decay, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. These are the eleven fires. We are burning with these fires. When we practice metta, these are the fires that will be extinguished. Greed will not arise, hatred will not arise, delusion will not arise in the mind. They all will completely be vanished from our mind when we practice metta. Therefore, metta practice should be extremely important. We must do it mindfully, correctly, with understanding. Then the third is mindfulness of breathing about uh, should be developed to cut off thoughts. <coughs> you see, I mentioned yesterday when we uh, started our metta meditation, when we practice mindfulness of breathing, number one thing that happens is our thoughts of desire, ill will, sleepiness, drowsiness, restlessness and worry all fades away. Why? Because the mind is focused on neutral object. Object that has nothing to do with emotions. Object that is universally true. Object that every living being shares. And therefore, when we focus the mind on our breath, since the breath is so pure, there is no reason for us to cling to it or to reject it. Accepting and rejection is totally vanished from our mind because we have to breathe. Whether you like it or not, you have to breathe if you want to live. And when we focus the mind, our mind on the breath, therefore all our thoughts give way, disappear. And that's a wonderful first benefit of mindfulness of breathing. We practice it to overcome our thoughts in order to cut off thoughts. Number nine, last one, perception, perception of impermanence should be developed to eradicate the conceit, I am. As I mentioned yesterday, I am is the conceit. I mentioned three things yesterday. I am, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. This is one of them. I am is the representation of greed. If you put greed one side, equal mark, I am. Greed equal to I am. So, when we practice impermanence, we should be able to overcome our conceit, I am. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I am, greed is mine, mine. I am is conceit. So, when one perceives impermanence, the perception of non-self is established, Okay. One who perceives non-self eradicates the conceit I am, which is Nibbana, Asmimana. Last uh, two, uh, last five letters is desire for 
in material realization, this I have uh, material uh, material existence, in material existence, then conceit, then restlessness and ignorance. Now asmimana, the concept of I am completely vanishes, disappears when we attain full enlightenment. That is called Nibbana, until such time. So when the, uh, when the Buddha gave Venerable uh, Medya very long detailed discourse to remember and practice. Then Venerable Medya practiced it according to the Buddha's advice because this is a very rich discourse, full of meaning, full of advices, and when the media followed these advices, and soon he attained full enlightenment after the Buddha's advice. One thing Buddha did not say, that is what I told you, I asked you not to go. You came back again. He did not say that. He even did not mention anything about that. He said, Megya, when the mind is not mature, the spiritual is not mature, these are things you should do. When you do this, you can attain liberation. So after that you go to that mango grove and practice. When the Megya didn't have to go there, very soon he attained enlightenment by following these instructions. So friends, that is the end of today's talk. And uh, I hope uh, you have learned something from this. And uh, we learn to something to put them into practice and liberate ourselves. Sooner or later, sooner the better. Okay. Okay. So.